قل هذه سبيلي أدعو إلى الله على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وآله وصحبه وما اهتدى بهداه أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to this new episode of Ask Zad coming to you every Saturday between Maghrib and Isha here in Mecca region and due to the huge number of callers we will go straight to your phone calls so brother Yunus from Germany Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. If I wipe my ears like uh, like you told me, and my thumb only touches two thirds of my outer ear, is this okay because my ear is wider than, than my thumb or not? So if it touches four quarters or four fifths of your ear, is it okay or not? Yunus. Yunus? Probably, yes. If it touches four fifths? Most, most likely. Okay, uh, three quarters? Maybe. Half? Mm, probably, I don't, I don't know. So what's the logic of me qu asking you these questions? Um, you're saying I'm, o I'm overthinking. I'm saying that what is mandatory is to wipe. And this is the sunnah. What percentage is not mentioned? So whatever counts as wiping does the job. For example, we are ordered in the Quran to wipe over our heads. Now, definitely, I'm not going to wipe every strand of hair. So what's the percentage? It's not mentioned. Whatever counts as wiping, that's the job. So if you do this with your ear and you move on, it's what Allah Azza wa Jal told you to do. You don't have to go to details. As they say, the devil is in the details. Ahna from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Assalamu Shaykh, what is the ruling on going to wedding feasts where the men and women would be eating in the same room? If they are not segregated, if it is free mixing, this is not permissible. But if they are in separate tables away from one another and the women are concealed, they are wearing the proper hijab, there's no problem in that. We go to restaurants and there's no problem in others being in the restaurant when we're eating and Allah knows best. Hamza from Bosnia. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alaikum assalamu wa uh, Sheikh, I know that it is not permissible to take non-Muslims as close friends. There is a Christian guy who lives in another country, and he comes to my country twice a year. Whenever he comes to my country, he sends me a text message asking me if he is welcome to come to my house. I don't do this for dawah purposes, but just to catch up with him. If I accept him in my house twice a year and I don't have any types of communications with him in the meantime, would I be considered as the one who takes Christians as close friends? The answer is no. There is no problem in entertaining him twice a year casually like any other person. This is not taking them as allies or uh, uh, close confidants and there's no problem in that. Adrian from Serbia. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. So, what is your opinion on the Arab revolt in the first war? In the first world war. I wasn't there, so I am not uh, qualified to judge or say or talk about these things. Besides, it's like a gazillion years ago. Why would anyone, in his sound mind, would ask about the ruling of something that would not? get him closer to Allah. What we know is at the moment revolting against the Muslim rulers is totally prohibited. 
by the Quran, by the Sunnah, by the consensus of the uh, uh, um, trusted scholars, shall we say. Because we've seen what it resulted in the past 15 years. Devastation, chaos, people cannot travel, cannot go to school, cannot live. They're mis displaced all over the country and their passports has no, have no value. What benefit did they gain? Show me one country that benefited from such revolt and, and, and rebellion. So this is what the, the, the Sunnah tells us not to do and whoever defies it will find and face the consequences. May Allah protect us. Hassan from Japan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. كيف حالك يا شيخ؟ حياك الله. شو اسمه؟ Last time I uh, gave you a little brief about my country and uh, that how they against the Sunnah. Mm. And this time I want to ask about the Jum'ah prayer. Like uh, it's quite different. Like I uh, when I first came to Japan, I realized it's totally different. So I find out this is the actually correct way. Uh, first, they um, we have two khutbas like in there, and like first they give a khutbah and then they. Uh, give adhan and then they all pray together the the shisma, the what is it the tahiyat al masjid and then uh, four rakat sunnah and then uh, again khutbah and then it goes like two rakat fard and four rakat sunnah and four rakat akhir al dhuhr and then two rakat hada al waqt they have many uh, rakats to pray يعني, so in in this case يعني, what should I do like uh, even like we are not allowed to pray why khutbah is given, like, you know, you cannot pray tahiyyat uh, al-masjid before the, I mean, uh, like, you know, ending the the khutbah, yani. So what, what should I do in this case? Should I go and pray with them or should I pray at home? Or? This is in Japan? No, this is my original country. This is not in Japan. Ah, so basically speaking, all what you've mentioned is bogus, has nothing to do with Islam. Now, what has to do with Islam is the two khutbas that come immediately after the Imam says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And he sits down and the muaddin gives the adhan. Then he stands up to deliver two khutbah. This is the Jumu'ah. Whatever khutbah was before that, this is, has nothing. This is called tabligh or balagh or bayan. Has nothing to do with the Jumu'ah. The prayers they offered has nothing to do with the Jum'ah. So all what you have to do is just enter the masjid before the Imam comes and pray to Raka'at Tahit and message and sit down. When he comes in and gives his khutbah in your native language, you don't have to listen to that. When he finishes and then he says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and sits down and the muaddin gives the adhan, this is the adhan of Jum'ah. After he finishes, the Imam delivers two khutbahs and after he finishes, he comes down and prays two fard. This is your Jumu'ah. After he finishes, you leave. I hope this answers your question. Najwa from the UK. Najwa. Dafi from Indonesia. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam to Allah. So, uh, if I'm doing jama'ah prayer on the last sujood, I usually make dua for a long amount of time. But if the imam already lifts his head, should I cut my dua or can I just keep continue pray my, my dua? Just you Allah. must, you must cut your dua and follow the imam. It is not permissible to be late than the imam. And the, Im the, the follower has four types of following the Imam. Either he coincides with the Imam and follows the Imam, meaning when the Imam makes rukur, he makes rukur. When the Imam rises up, he rises up. No delay. Number two, he, co who, he coincides and imitates the Imam. So as soon as the Imam says, Allahu Akbar, he does with it. Sami Allahu liman hamida, he rises with him. And this is wrong. He should wait until he reaches the standing position. He should wait until he puts his forehead on the ground before he bends his back. The third is to be 
ahead of his imam. So as the imam goes for a ruku and says, Allah, and the guy is already in sujood before the imam. This nullifies his prayer, if done intentionally. And number four is to delay. So the imam rises up from sujood, Allahu Akbar, and the guy is still doing dua. Just until the imam is going to go for the second sujood, he raises up and follows him. This is also not permissible. Nazar from India. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum assalamu wa barakatuhu. Sheikh, what is the ruling on working in a software development industry where majority of the tech companies takes projects of various domains from numerous clients irrespective to the compliance of Sharia, even though a person... What do you mean by in, 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 in not in compliance with Sharia? Oh, but usually when a person working in such tech departments works on a project that incorporates the halal domains like retail, e-commerce, telecom, etc. for various monthly period. But usually one or two projects in a year that is assigned are of conventional banking domain. And okay. okay, if this is the case, Akhi, your work is halal, providing that you're serving halal. So if I work for a mechanic and I fix cars it's not of my business where they're using these cars for or what are they using it for but when I get a car that is for a interest uh, a based bank a conventional bank and I know that they commute they serve they do riba work with that car hypothetically I cannot work on that I cannot assist in that. So if you're working on general programs like calculator program, like um, uh, project management, uh, paperless uh, 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 environment and the likes, these are all halal. But if you were assigned to design a software for a bank or for an insurance company, this is haram and you must refrain from assisting them. Arsalan from the U.S. Arsalan? Adi Kunel from Nigeria. Adi Kunel. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Um, in our normal workplace, you know, um, a colleague um, who happens to be a female wants to you know, move to another department and are in fact with the responsibility of organizing like a, more or less like a lunch or something. And where, you know, I can't understand you, Adi Kunal. I cannot understand what you're saying, Akhi. Okay, okay. I'm saying that um, we work. I work in a place where you know we, it's more or less a mixed environment where males and females work together. So um, one of our colleague, one of my colleagues, is actually moving to another department. So I'm taxed with the responsibility of organizing like a lunch where all team members will just you know take lunch together and do like a send forth. So is it possible, permissible for me to you know to organize? If they're organizing a lunch or a party and it is free mixed, no, you're not allowed to attend this and you must save and protect your chastity from being involved in such socializing activities with the opposite gender. Zaid from the Emirates. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum as Sheikh, my masjid is uh, 10 minutes away. So is it further on me to go pray in every you know, prayer? The answer is yes. A 10 minutes walk is about less or more than one kilometer. And in normal conditions, if a man stood on the top of the masjid and called the adhan as loud as he can, this distance of one kilometer would carry his voice to you. And the Prophet said to the blind man, alayhi salatu wasalam, and this is the measuring stick. 
when he came to ask for permission not to attend the congregational prayer. The Prophet said, alayhi salam, do you hear the adhan? The man said, yes. The Prophet said, ajib, respond and answer it because there is no permission for you and Allah knows best. Abdurrahman from India. Assalamualaikum, Shaykh. Alaykum assalam wa rahmatullah. Uh, due to urine inconsistency, sometimes one or two drops urine came out of my came out and uh, I don't know where they fall on my clothes. And in rainy season, sometimes roadside mud splashes on my dress. Even if I cleaned it, some stains remains. So if I pray with these clothes, will my prayer valid? I can't change the clothes because I'm on my on the on the way to work or the difficult times. Abdul Rahman, one question: When you say one or two drops fall on your trousers. Do you see them? Yeah, I feel, I feel like. I feel. I feel is a phrase of doubt. And certainty is not affected by doubt. Whenever you hear yourself say, I feel, I think, I believe, maybe, perhaps, immediately disregard this doubt and throw it in the dustbin. Because everything is pure until proven, underline proven, and put high bold, uh, uh, highlighted, change the color, put it in caps, all caps, proven. If you don't have proof, then you disregard it. Fahim from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamualaikum. A 55 year old woman wishes to visit her husband's grave from a very close distance. It's been three years since he passed away, and she never ever visited his graveyard. But now she wants to visit his grave with her adult son as Maharam. She also wants to bring her teenage daughter if permitted. So are they allowed to make this visit at least once in their life? Jazakallah. What jazakum? First of all, visiting graveyards is a recommended sunnah for male, for men. As for women, it's an issue of dispute. Scholars differed whether it's permissible or not, I'm inclined to follow the opinion that says that this is totally prohibited and not, not permissible. And this is the opinion of Sheikh bin Baz, Ibn Ithaymeen, and other great scholars of our time. So I'm inclined to say that no, she should not do that. Rather, she should do what's more beneficial, which is making dua, giving charity on his behalf, making umrah or making Hajj, and Allah knows best. Mooney from Canada. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Um, Sheikh, if I tell someone something is halal or something is haram without asking like a Sheikh or doing research, but I used my prior knowledge, and then later on I found out that my fatwa was wrong, I did not mean to like purposefully lie on Islam. Do I need to retake my shahada? No, of course not. See, the issue of retaking your shahada is done only when you commit deliberately an act of kufr or shirk. And giving the wrong fatwa out of goodwill and thinking that you're giving the right fatwa according to your knowledge, to the best of your knowledge, and finding out that you were wrong, there is no kufr or shirk in that, none whatsoever. Sad man from Bangladesh. Sad man. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Uh, Sheikh, my question was that, uh, is it mandatory to pray in the masjid or is it mandatory to uh, pray in the with, with the congregation for man? The answer is, it is mandatory to pray in the masjid unless there is a legitimate reason that would make you pray elsewhere but with the congregation. So the default is that whenever the adhan is called, all Muslims should pray in the masjid. If clusters of Muslims prayed in their homes, four or five of them in congregation, then that would make the, mas the masajid uh, vacant and that would dismantle the purpose and the role of 
the masjid and this is not part of our religion and Allah knows best. Muhammad from Canada. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. So, Shaykh, there is a political leader in my country, and uh, that particular leader is extremely, I mean, they are very anti Islamic. So, a few days ago, I made a meme regarding them, and uh, I called them overweight in that meme, and that meme went viral. But now I'm realizing if I did a sin or not, and it's been three to four days and not been able to get this thought out of my mind. Is he so a Muslim? No, no, they're not Muslim. No problem, inshallah. Just try not to be caught. Very simple. Uh, Misbah from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Sheikh. Alaykum, uh, Sheikh, my wife saw a dream in which uh, uh, one of her deceased family member instructs her to do something good, like giving charity or something. And many times for the past year, she's having this dream. She wants to know what should she do? Should she follow this dream and what to do? Such dreams can be generated by your subconscious and can be a glad tiding from Allah Azza wa Jal if what the dream says makes you happy, makes you optimistic. And it's a good thing such as doing good deeds and giving away in charity. So there's no problem, alhamdulillah, as long as this was telling her to do something that Allah loves, which is giving charity. Giving charity is something that is recommended and good as well. Nazli from Azerbaijan. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Uh, Sheikh, I saw on the internet that if a woman during menstruation makes uh, the in intention not to perform salah, because if she does it, it would be um, as a sin, then she receives a reward from this. Is it permissible or not? Again, please, if a woman prays while in her menses? Uh, like I saw on the internet that if a woman during menstruation makes the intention not to perform uh, salah because if she does it, it would be as a sin. Then she receives a reward from this. Is it permissible? No, this is not permissible. She is refraining because her prayer is invalid. If she prays, she's sinful. So she's not praying because it's haram. It's defying Sharia to pray while in the state of menses. So I don't have to go to that extent, which is I'm intending not to pray so that I'm rewarded. Rather, I just stop praying because Allah told me not to pray. As simple as that. But to go to the extreme of making intentions and then breaking your intention, and this confuses people. My intention is I don't pray because Allah ordered me not to pray. Full stop, and you will be rewarded for that. Medina from Germany. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, um, how can one stop labeling people as kafir in their head since they believe they would commit kufr by not doing it? By looking at the mirror. Because if you have the audacity to label people as kafir without knowledge, without proof, then look at the mirror and recognize that you might be a kafir for doing such a thing and others may consider you to be a kafir for many things that you are doing without you knowing it. So it's a two-way game. Two can play this game. As Muslims, whenever I look at someone older than me, I feel envious because he had done so many good deeds I could not reach yet. And when I look at someone younger than me, I pity myself because he did not make as many sins as I have done or committed. So I always look little at myself. You're doing the opposite. You're boasting about your deeds, thinking that you're the only one who's a Muslim and everybody else, everyone else is a kafir for one reason or the other. This would, which would probably reserve your seat in hellfire. You have to stop thinking like this and start, start to be modest and humble and express your poverty to Allah 
and think well of everyone else while thinking badly of your own flaws and shortcomings and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu said that a man came to the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, O Messenger of Allah, poverty has struck me. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent a messenger to one of his wives to bring something for that man to eat. But she said, by the one who sent you with the truth, I only have water. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent to another one of his wives to bring something for the man to eat. But she said the same until all of them said the same thing. Then Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Who will take this one as a guest in exchange for Allah's mercy? A man from the Ansar said, I will, O messenger of Allah. So he took the man to his home and said to his wife, Treat the guest of the Messenger of Allah well. She said, By Allah, we have nothing except the meal for my children. He said, Get the food ready and light the lamp and put your children to sleep. If they ask for dinner, then when the guest enters, dim the lamp and make it seem as if we are eating. And when he reaches for the food to eat, then stand up to the lantern and turn it off. She got the food ready, turned the lamp on and put the children to sleep. She then went to the lamp as if she was fixing it and turned it off. Then they pretended as they were eating and they both went to sleep hungry. In the morning, the man from the Ansar went to Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said, Allah has laughed, implying his acceptance to the deed from your actions last night. Then Allah revealed his saying, which means, and they give them preference over themselves, even though they were in need of that. Reported by Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. We have Areej from the UK. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, Sheikh, we know that the, the vote for praying in Masjid and Nabi um, are considered better than performing 1,000 prayers, and praying in Masjid al um, Haram is 100,000 times better in, uh, than in any other masjid. I'm curious about the way this reward system applies to individuals living near these um, sacred places who have the opportunity to pray there regularly compared to those living farther away or in different countries. Um, so I wanted to know how can Muslims living in uh, different countries or further away maximize their reward for prayers? Well, <laughs> the only way they can do that is to shift to Mecca and Medina. Very simple. This is a reward set by Allah Azza wa Jal as an incentive for those who live in such a beautiful city as Mecca or Medina. And those who live elsewhere are definitely deprived from such a reward. This is Allah's favor and blessing upon people. I don't have the luxury of saying, how can I enjoy the beautiful weather of uh, this country or that in Europe during springtime when it's boiling hot where I live. This is Allah's favor and blessing upon people. He awards those whom he wills with what he wants. Living in Mecca and Medina is not easy. There's a lot of hardship involved, especially for those who may run businesses and they have to travel all the time, and they need to be in a sort of a hub to be able to go all over the world for their meetings and, and, and the likes. 
so they may find it difficult. There are no quote unquote international schools like those in Jeddah or in Riyadh or elsewhere. There are so many things that these cities may lack other than spirituality. So you want to compromise all of this because you want 100,000 prayers per prayer or 1,000 prayer per prayer? Shift and move if you can. If you can't, then this is Allah's favors and blessing upon the people. It's like saying, okay, millionaires and billionaires who give in charity and zakat, how can we reach their level in the money they give in charity which we cannot afford? This is Allah's favors and blessing and Allah knows best. Anna's from Canada. Ya Anas. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Shaykh. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. So uh, my question is about takbiratul uh, intiqal in salah. When I make a takbir before I move or uh, like before I make the ruku' or after I finish ruku' or sujood, not along the movement, uh, do I, uh, out of forgetfulness, do I need to make sujood as Okay. A lot of the scholars emphasize that the place of takbiratul intiqal or the takbir of movement is between the pillars. So if I'm going from the standing position to sujood, I don't say Allahu Akbar and then I move like so many imams do just to ensure that their voices are beautifully um, relayed through the microphone. This is ignorance from their side. Some other imams postpone the takbir until they reach the ground and they say while in sujood, Allahu Akbar, so that people would not rush and race them. And both are wrong. The sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was to be said in between. So once you start moving, you say Allahu Akbar and you end the ar usually when your forehead is about to hit the ground. And once the imam's forehead hits the ground, only then the followers start to bend their backs. They don't start to bend their backs and knees the moment the imam moves, no. They wait until his forehead touches the ground as per the sunnah. This is why some scholars said, if the imam fails to say the takbir at the right time, so he says it while standing or when he reaches the other position, his prayer is invalid. And to invalidate someone's prayer, you need evidence. You just can't speak out of thin air and say, your prayer is invalid. No, this is not logical nor permissible. And also to say that you have to perform sujood as sahu for such a mistake or such a movement, intentional uh, uh, action, needs also a dalil or a, an evidence to back it up. So I'm inclined to say that such a person, such an imam, is wrong. Yet the prayer is valid and there is no requirement or need for sujood as sahu and Allah Azza wa knows best. Hamza from Sweden. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have a question. Why is it better to pray in a Salafi masjid where they do a bid of having two khatibs? Like, oh, first the Imam does a khutbah in Arabic and then says salam and someone else stands up and does it in the local language. Or to go to a Hanafi masjid where the Imam believes that Mawlid is good and openly promotes it, but they only do it in one language. And thus, not doing the same bid as the other masjid. The first masjid is a Salafi masjid and he has two khatibs for both Jum'ah khutbah? Yeah. That is very awkward. And I don't think that this is even permissible. The khutbah has to be delivered by one imam. The prayer can be delivered by someone, by, can be led by someone else. But to split the khutbah into two, this is not permissible. So I would recommend that you go to the Hanafi masjid and never to call this masjid, the first one, as a Salafi masjid. Abdul Rahman from the U.S.
عبد الرحمن السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله وبركاته سو شيخ ما كوشن از از ريجاردينج لايك وركينج فور لايك ا ا لايك ا كار رنتل كومباني ناو ذي وات ذي دو از ذي سيل يو لايك ا تيمبوري انشورنس فور ذا رنتد كار ناو ليتس سي يو دونت هاف ليتس سي يو ار نوت فورس باي ذا كومباني تو اوفر ذيم ذا ديل وذر ذي تيك ات اور نوت Uh, are you is it, are you sinful and are you sinful for working for them for, in a offers insurance? Isn't it, isn't it mandatory to have this insurance? No, it's not mandatory because people can use uh, a lot of uh, other companies. They offer like their own. Like let's say you use the one you have by law for your own car, and they, you can use that one for for a rented car as well. And then there's no problem if you don't uh, opt for it. There's no problem if they insist on having one. Also, there's no problem, inshallah. Mehwish from the U.S. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, if a person decides to move to a Kafir country and uh, lives there, has his kids there, And then the kids turn out messed up as a result of their surroundings because they didn't get fair preaching. How are the kids accountable? Yani, isn't is it okay to blame the parents for how misguided they have become, or is this check? Jazakum Allah khairan. What jazakum? First of all, the parents are accountable for migrating to a kafir country, but this is all where it ends. We cannot cascade this to blame them for any wrongdoing the children uh, may do because the children are adults. They chose to act in such a fashion. I know a lot of families that live in the U.S. and in Europe who are practicing, who are taking their kids to Sunday schools to learn the Quran, who takes them to Jumu'ah and Jama'at, and they try their level best to upbring them in an Islamic way, and they, f- and, and they succeed big time. Their children are practicing, mashallah, and they're leading a good, successful Islamic life. And I know of parents living in Muslim countries, miles away from Mecca or from Medina, and they fail big time in upbringing their children where their children are heedless, they don't know where the Qibla is, they don't know what the Haram looks like. So this is not a one size that fits all. Sometimes you do your level best with your children and Allah Azza wa Jal wills it otherwise. Yes, the environment does have an impact. So the chances of your children going astray in the U.S., is far higher and greater than them going astray in a Muslim country. So as long as the parents are doing their due diligence and trying their level best, then the fault would fall upon the children, not the parents. Abdullah from Canada. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Assalamu Sheikh, I, I saw one of your videos on YouTube where you said that it's permissible to recite Salah by just moving your tongue without without any audible noise. My question is, can I do the same with the morning and evening afghar by reciting the afghar without, sorry, by reciting the afghar with just moving my tongue without any audible noise? Of course. Imagine if you're in the masjid alongside 200 individuals and each one of them is making a noise when saying the afghar or reading the Quran. That would be annoying. And disturbing the peace and distracting you from even doing your own adhkar. Yes, the sunnah is to say it silently without making a noise. Salman from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. May Allah make you live long and make you continue what you're doing like no peace be upon me. And you as well, but 950 years is a lot, akhi. Yani, yani may Allah azza wa jal make it a swift and easy and peaceful ending for all of us. Hmm. What's your question? I mean, uh, Sheikh, I know of a brother who does not wear underwear. He forgot to close the zip in his pants and after praying two and a half rakas in Vahar behind Imam, he realized that he did not close it. 
so it was very much probable that his private part was exposed so is his war sala valid no if his private part was exposed for a raka or more then this is a lot of time the scholars say if the aura was exposed for a little time and then concealed there's no problem but if it was exposed for a long time whether you knew about it or not the prayer is invalid he has to repeat the prayer t from london assalamu alaikum sheik of santullah sheik after embracing islam um there were times when i was weak uh, and i committed sins which were caught on camera by other people videographed photographed alhamdulillah made toba this was um in the past so i wanted to know uh, the general principle regarding asking people to delete your pictures and videos because some people if you ask them and the whole village went to a certain event and then you ask one person and word gets around you ask them they may delete it but other people may be more uh, they may stir the problem some people you tell them you're muslim and they may not delete the videos and pictures they may keep them and some people they may have a picture and video of you but if you bring it to them is it better to just ask them if if you feel like they will just forget about you and forget about it not to ask them just in case there is that potential that if you ask them and they don't delete it then you brought attention to the situation jazakallah khair what is that personally i'm an inclined to say just forget about it put a lid on it and move on there are a lot of people who are evil and bad and the moment i approach them and say akhi you have a picture of me that is in inappropriate so wallah oh i didn't know that and they go search and they magnify it and they spread it all over the place so it's best to put a lid on it and just forget it and ask allah for forgiveness and move on Irfan from India. Assalamu alaikum sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Sheikh wearing a kufi during salah but not considering it We're as wearing mandatory. What? Wearing what? Wearing a, a kufi during salah hmm. but not considering it as mandatory and I won't get any rewards from it. There's no problem in that if you wear a kufi if you wear a topi on your head during salat without thinking that it's mandatory or it's a condition of your prayer being valid you just think that it looks better and it's uh, keeping you safe from uh, ignorant people's comments there's no problem in that at all abdul qadir from uk assalam alaikum sheikh alaikum assalam to allah allah mubarak and fi as well jazakallah khairan Sheikh, uh, here in the UK, uh, it's very hard to get driver license. So some people they go to maybe South Africa and get uh, driver license. So they buy it without uh, passing the test. So what's the ruling on that? It is not permissible to bribe whether you go to South Africa or you go anywhere else. A bribe is a bribe. Getting a driver's license. without following the normal channel of taking a school and um, passing the test and the likes is totally prohibited this is a bribe and the prophet alayhi salatu wasalam cursed those who give it and those who receive it so you don't want to fall under this curse hina from india hina Uh, yeah, Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes, Hina. Can you hear me, sir? Now I can hear you. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Kaim salam to Allah. Uh, as you have thought, thread like discharges before heavy flow is not counted. Therefore, I skip those days. But after two or three uh, days, mostly before heavy flow, uh, I get clotted like thick blood for maybe two days. And if I show this to my mother, she will consider it as menses. And should I count this... clotted thick blood as menses or only the heavy flow you must not consider it as your menses until you see the flow of the blood because this is still considered to be part of your istihada and you should continue to pray and fast ayat from the us assalamu alaikum sheikh wa rahmatullah 
Sheikh, there is a 12-year-old boy who came to stay with us. He's not Mehram because his parents went to Hajj. I'm wearing a baya and hijab in front of him. Do I also have to wear niqab? Well, it is best for you to stay away from because lots of the boys reach the age of puberty around that age. So definitely, if he has reached the age of puberty, it is mandatory upon you to wear the niqab. And if he did not, it is highly recommended that you do wear the niqab, and Allah knows best. Mustafa from the UK. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, yeah, so Sheikh, um, I had a question uh, which a friend wanted me to ask you. Uh, I kind of know the answer. I feel you're going to give to this, but I'll just ask in case uh, still. Uh, and so the question he asks is, and I quote, uh, what should I do if my fiance says that she wants mehendi and barat instead of just the nikah and the walima function? She wants, uh, she wants, she wants what? And, uh, he wants, uh, his fiance wants the Mahendi and Barat function. What is the Barat function? Sheikh, there are, these are just two um, extra ceremonies uh, which uh, take part in the Indo-Pak subcontinent. And he only wants the Nikah and the Walima, but I think the fiance wants those two extra, extra functions as well. Okay, first of all, the Mahendi is a gathering, I think, where they decorate the bride and the groom with hinna and decoration on their body. If there is free mixing or mixing between the groom and other women who are non-mahram or the opposite, this is totally prohibited. But if it's only for women and they only follow a cultural thing that has nothing to do with the Hindus, it's a cultural thing that even the Muslims do and they have pride in it, it has nothing to do with the Hindus, no men are admitted, no nan mahram would ever see her in her hinna and decoration, this is permissible. The barat thing, I don't know about it, but the same concept applies. Now, if you as a groom don't feel like doing it, you just simply say, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to do the walima. This is my obligation in Islam. You want to do the other two functions according to the Sharia, your father has to pay for it, or you pay for it from your mahar, and Allah knows best. Ahmed from the U.S. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sheikh, for work, I have some compliance training. Um, that's a governmental requirement. Some of the topics on this training have to do with gender identity, discrimination, LGBTQ2, uh, whatever it's called. Um, as part of this training, um, I have to answer certain questions at the end of each topic to move on. Um, now, if I answer these questions by not really believing them, but only because they're a requirement for work, am I sinful? No problem at all in answering the questions according to the curriculum or to the syllabus you're studying in order to pass the exam, because this is something you resent and hate in your heart, but you're doing it to pass the exams. There's no problem in that, inshallah. Ahmed from Oman. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum assalamu alaikum. Uh, I wanted to ask you whether it's permissible for athletes to wear shorts that uh, show their knees, or do we have to cover our knees? It is an issue of dispute, and the most authentic opinion is that a man's knees are not part of his aura. The aura extends from the navel to the knee, but the knee is not included. So there's no problem in showing it. Is it appropriate? I would not recommend it. I wouldn't do it myself, but I don't say that it is haram because the knees are not part uh, of the aura and Allah knows best. Ubadah from Syria. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, Sheikh, I have a question that, like, so when I tell someone to do something that Allah loves, for instance, give charity, like, I taught him that I get rewarded if he does it, right? Correct. So if I, for instance, ask, ask, uh, ask you a question, for, um, how many rakats before Fajr, you said two, and somebody learned that from my question, do I also get rewarded? Or if I asked you for a book recommendation and somebody heard it and read it, do I get rewarded? Allah Azza wa Jal is the most generous, subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
is it difficult for Allah to grant you a reward for something that you had intended with good intention to benefit the Muslims? The answer is no. It's not difficult at all. So we deal with Allah with his, through his beautiful name, Al-Jawad Al-Kareem. So you think highly of Allah and Allah is as you think of him. Sami from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum salam to Allah. So, Sheikh, I have a question. Uh, is it permissible to listen to white noises uh, during sleeping? Because I have, uh, I have kind of insomnia. No problem in, in listening to white uh, uh, noises because it's not music and there's nothing wrong in it, inshallah. Madani from, the, from Saudi. Madani from Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum. Assalam. Sheikh, is it permissible to play horror games while keeping the audio completely mute? As long as there is no haram in such horror games, as long as there is nothing haram, no um, crosses, no giving life to the dead, no uh, shirk, nothing violent, no decapitating heads and blood all over the place like doom and the others, there's no problem in it, inshallah. Arsalan from the U.S. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salamatullah. Sheikh, I wanted to ask you because I know there is a lot of slander about Sheikh. Don't, uh, don't, 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 don't ever mention Shuyukh on our program. Thank you very much. It's inappropriate. Give me a call person to person, then we can discuss this, inshallah. Sarim from Canada. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, is it okay if I ask two questions? Nope. One only. Okay. Um, the, if the closest masjid to me is around the 10 minute walk, but it is Sufi or Barilwi, and they do a lot of bid'ah, is it permissible for me to go there? And as, the rest of them. As long as there isn't any other Ahli Hadith masjid or a clean masjid that has no innovation, and this is the only masjid you have. If the imam is involved in shirk or kufr, you must not pray there. But if it's only bid'ah, then this is the only alternative and choice you have. So you go there and pray and leave immediately without participating in their bid'ahs. Muhammad from China. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam to Allah. Uh, Sheikh, uh, I have a question that Previously, there was the person who borrowed money from my father and he thought it as it was like a favor for him. But my father wrote this in his record book. And now fast forward around five years or six years, my father has passed away. May Allah have mercy on him. Uh, but when we approached this person and asked him for the money. I understand uh, your question, Akhi, because we have 10 seconds left. The answer is, if you don't have a tangible evidence that can be held uh, um, in a, a court of law, then you have no right in asking for this money because it's your father's writing against this man's word. You go to the court and say, this man borrowed a thousand euros from my father. The evidence is my father wrote that this man borrowed a thousand euros from him. The judge goes to him, said, did you borrow? He said, no. I didn't borrow anything. He gave, me, gave it to me as a gift. So who will be the decisive word? His or your father's? Your father did not take a paper from this man saying that I borrowed this much from X, Y, Z. And therefore, you cannot claim such a money unless he confesses that, yes, I borrowed it, or you bring two witnesses or a written Confession from him stating that I took this as a loan and Allah Azza wa knows best. This is all the time we have. And until we meet you tomorrow, Sunday at 4 o'clock here in Mecca region, I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> على بصيرة أنا ومن اتبعني 
وسبحان الله وما أنا من المشركين